Good morning and welcome to Discipleship Empowerment Study. We're glad that you're joining us today as we go on this journey of looking through 1 Peter and kind of relating the overall theme to persecution, trials, tribulations, suffering, those kinds of things that individual people go through in various ways. Sometimes it can be physically, sometimes it can be emotionally, and sometimes it can be also spiritually. And we're glad that you're joining us today, and we're moving into the verse 8 of chapter 3 of First Peter. And Lord willing, we'll be able to uh, put some more pieces together about what we've been talking about concerning our relationships with our governments, our bosses, our wife, our husband, uh, with our Lord Jesus Christ, with fellow believers in Christ. And uh, Peter is going to continue to try to get the church to focus, to get them to focus on their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what matters more than anything else. And so when we get over into verse 8 of chapter 3, it starts off with an unusual uh, beginning of this sentence, you could sort of say, in the New King James Bible. And why it's so unusual? Because it says, finally, all of you. You know, so we've been talking about all these different groups, and now he's saying, finally, all of you. Everyone who's reading this letter, everyone who's listening to what I'm having to say, he's now saying to all of you, whether you're Deacons, elders, disciples, employees, family members, husband and wife, governments, whatever you may be, to all of you, I've got something to finally share. And that what's what that's what's going to take us on through not only to the end of chapter three, but I believe also all the way over into the end of the book that he's trying to draw attention. Uh, to how we should be living and acting and walking our journey out with our shepherd and our overseer, Jesus Christ. And, and so <clears throat> when we uh, review a little bit yesterday, uh, we saw this idea of likewise wives and then all likewise husbands and how the husband should be treating the wife how the wife should be responding to not only their husbands, but to other people. Interesting information uh, that we are exhorted to take into our heart, to think through, uh, to apply to our lives. And so when he moves on now to this, finally, all of you, it's interesting that if we would uh, look at verses 8 and 9, we would see quite a few things that he lists off for all of us. So he starts off by finally, all of you be of one mind. Um, you know, there's a lot of division that goes on in in relationships. And to get that unity and harmony, I know a lot of times in board meetings where I uh, had the opportunity to be part of, one of the things is we worked hard to have consensus, not so much a vote, but to get that unity and harmony where you're working together, going in the same direction. And when he says of you, all of you be of one mind or to be of one thinking, uh, be of one teaching. You know, don't be scattered all over the place and having all different kinds of views concerning things. But your one mind, your mind to make a mind one has to be focused on one thing for going forward. You know what I mean? If you're driving in a car and you have 10 people driving with 10 different minds and they're all going 10 different uh, places or have 10 different goals, uh, they're going to go all over the place. There's not a oneness in that. But if you say to everybody, I want to meet you at Ikea in Winnipeg at 2 o'clock today. Uh, people would then say, okay, we get that one thing into our one mind and we head in one 
uh, purpose and goal is to get there by 2 o'clock. And so this idea of oneness, something that we need to be thinking about, because there's a lack of oneness, a lack of harmony and unity in the body of Christ. It's fragmented, going in different directions, having different beliefs and thoughts and concepts and dogmas and all kinds of other things, theology, which is causing the church to be scattered. And one of the biggest things that Satan works very, very hard at and is very, very successful at is to cause division, a separation, whether it's just in the home or whether it's throughout our world. So this idea of oneness, finally, all of you be of one mind. And then he goes on and tells us what should be in our mind, should be a mind of compassion. Compassion is like love, agape love, where we're compassionate with one another, compassionate for one another. So he's talking a lot to the believers here. He's talking about you should have compassion. I like the word compassion a lot of times even more than the word love because compassion gives the idea of activity, that you're doing something. You're not just saying, but you're actually doing. Having, you know, compassionately, uh, you know, when the uh, Jesus taught, and did miracles. He, he, we see this word compassion and activity that he did with the people. He had compassion on them, as you know, like sheep who had no shepherd, as it sometimes says. And we need to have compassion, and that we're to love one another. So, because he goes on here, he says, having compassion, you're doing something, you're ministering to each other. But you're also, you have love as brothers or as sisters. You know, you have a love for each other. You don't have sometimes just, well, outwardly I will give some type of love to that person, but inwardly I don't like them. I don't want to talk to them. I don't want to have anything to do with them. You know, this kind of, you know, two sides of things. Where compassionate love is an act of love from the heart for a brother or a sister it's actively doing something and so all of you be of one mind when it comes to your compassion and your love one for another and he goes on being tender-hearted you know not hard-hearted the the jewish people would understand this word tender-hearted because they would know that you know in the time of egypt when the people were coming out of egypt you know, the, we are told over and over again that Pharaoh's heart was hard or he had a hard-hearted heart. And it's important that our hearts not be hard, but be soft, you know, to those. And and, and that sometimes it's difficult to uh, ascertain whether you have a hard heart or not. And, and sometimes the way you can see whether you have a hard heart or not is how you respond to different people groups around you. If you respond by avoidance or respond that, you know, you don't want to look at them or you don't want to have anything to do with them, uh, they're not, they're, their situation is not moving you at all. You know, you're just, you're in your little bubble and you're moving on. And I, I remember uh, walking with Colwyn the streets of Vancouver and uh, we we would be discussing, you know, the people, you could literally see them doing drugs in front of you, you know, stirring up the little spoon and getting the syringe ready for drugs. You can see people laying on the ground. Uh, there was one corner, uh, Colwyn and I will remember that the gentleman, I don't know how many dogs did he have, one, two, two dogs, a guy down by that one store. And, you know... Uh, and the dogs are fat. The guy that owns them is skinny. <laughs> you know what I mean? And his little sign, you know, gives some money uh, so I can feed my dogs, I think it was. So he wasn't even... But what I'm trying to get at is when you walk by these people or, you know, we were in the hospital day in and day out. And, and seeing people sick and seeing people struggling and uh, having a tender heart where 
you know, we think, well, what, what do we have to give? Well, you can give a kind word. You can give help where you can give help. And, uh, and be available, if at all, to pray. That's, you know, something we can do. I remember, you know, uh, in the hospital, um, talking to different people. You know, I got the gift of gab, so I like to talk. And, and Colwyn likes to listen, so we're, we do good in that area. And and uh, to to hear, you know, like one man, you know, uh, talking. I've never met him before. Just walk into his room and just say, hey, I've heard you were on the plane with Maria coming down from up north. I hear you've got problems with your heart. I just really felt that I should come in and, and pray with you. And he said, yeah, I'm going to have open up heart surgery. They're going to open up my whole chest and work on my heart. And I'm really nervous about it. And now there's COVID on the floor and they don't know if they can do this surgery tomorrow or all those kinds of things. And I just said, can I pray for you? I don't even know if he's a believer. You know, another time I was in the waiting room and, and a lady was struggling because she was trying to get help for her aged mother. And, and her, you know, whether she should stay at home or not stay at home and all those kinds of things. And the only thing I could think of is, can I pray for you? And sometimes that's the only thing you can do. But to get to that place that you have a tender heart, you know, that your your mind is focused on having compassion and love one for another, and your heart is tender enough to be able to try to respond in some form or fashion. And I think that's interesting that he's saying, to all of you, you should have this. Finally, to all of you, be of one mind, be compassionate, love one another, be tender-hearted, and be courteous. And I think this is an interesting thing that he would have to say to the believers, be courteous. When I think of the word courteous, I think of manners. You know, and respect. Those kinds of things. And Peter is saying, in the midst of all, all these trials, tribulations, persecution, heartaches, the things that you're going through, be of one mind with each other. Be compassionate with each other. Love one another. Be tender-hearted. And you say, well, how can you do all that when you're going through trials and tribulations and persecutions and heartaches? That can all happen because of the Holy Spirit who empowers you. And so he says, be courteous. Show respect, you know, uh, to one another. Uh, hold each other up. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on in verse 9 and says, just in this whole area of courtesy, he says, don't be like the people of the world. I mean, he's not saying that, but that's what I'm reading into it. Don't be like the people of the world. Where they, you know, where they're returning evil for evil. You know, you did something bad to me, I'm going to do something bad to you. You cut me off, I'll cut you off. You bumped into me, I'll bump into you. You say something to me, I'll say something to you. And he says, don't return evil for evil. Even Jesus teaches this. And then he goes on and he says, don't be reviling one another or sometimes even to uh, curse or swear at one another can you imagine he's saying this to the believers <laughs> you know what I mean? i'm thinking about this wow and that's why he could say finally all of you you know don't repay evil for evil just because people are doing evil to you that doesn't mean you have the right to do evil to them i'm thinking that he's probably you know these people are struggling with the roman soldiers struggling with the roman government struggling with all the other religions that are around about and everything and, you know, they're cursing you and throwing stones at you, so you better curse them and throw stones back at them. No, God is our judge. Our goal as a believer is to be of one mind in the Lord, compassionate, loving one another, tenderhearted, and courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling each other. It's an amazing thought when you think about it. And you say, well, you know, Pastor Jim, all these things you teach every morning, if we were to apply them all to our heart, it would be a full-time ministry. Well, it is a full-time ministry. It is a full, that's why we die to ourselves and live to, for Christ. That when we go out today, can you imagine if you could write this little bit on a piece of paper and stick it in the dash of your car 
or stick it someplace where you're walking and say, okay, I want to be one mind with the Lord. I want to be compassionate today. I want to love my brothers and sisters. I want to have a tender heart towards people and be courteous to them. I do not want to give evil for evil. And I don't want to revile or curse people who curse me. Can you imagine just having that little written down on a card and saying, this is how I'm going to walk today. Not in my strength, but in the Lord Jesus Christ. But then he uses this word, but, as a comparison. And he goes on and, and uh, the, you know, this is going to blow you away. Because when you see what Peter is trying to say to us, we almost think it's impossible. But it's possible. All things are possible through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. He goes, so he goes on. But on the contrary, on the opposite, blessings. You know, bless people knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. What are you called to? You're called to bless people. You're called to bless your brothers and sisters. You're called to bless your family. You know, we've got to be able to... My friend Carrie says we got to put this on a t-shirt. <laughs> but we got to bless people. You know, you know, uh I, I every time I go grocery shopping and everything and they say thank you to me after I pay my bill, you know, often I say to them, you know, the Lord bless you. Thank you. And I say that just almost by natural way of talking nowadays because I want people not realizing that I was fulfilling scripture here, <laughs> you know, where it says, you know, on the con but on the contrary, blessings, knowing that you are called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. So you give blessings so that you may inherit blessings. Can you imagine if we had this attitude that we would go out all day long blessing people, knowing that somewhere along the line, God's going to bless us back? Wouldn't that be an amazing thought? That we live, you know, in blessing you shall be blessed, in giving you shall receive. I mean, Jesus talks about all this. And that you will inherit a blessing. Doesn't necessarily mean that you'll have the blessing here on earth right away, but you will inherit a blessing. Then he goes on in verse uh, 10, and he begins to quote a lot of things from Psalm. Psalm 34, uh, verses 12 to 16, Psalm 37, verse 27. Proverbs verse 16, verse 7, you'll see sometimes when they italicize it and they set it out more as a poetry in a sense, that's from the Hebrew scriptures. And so he goes on using this word, because you're like that, because you're walking this way, for he who loves life and sees good day, he who loves life, verse 10, he, sorry, he who would love life and see good days. So if you do these things, if you're loving life, you're loving people in your life, you will see good days. Let him refrain his tongue from speak from evil and let his lips from speaking deceit. So you now he narrows it all down. And not only ta uh, talking about the whole area of our actions, but as James writes in the book of James, how often our tongue you know, it's such a small little member gets us into big trouble. You know, uh, it's an amazing thing. And we've got to work on that. And boy, that's a full-time job, you know, for me <laughs> often. That we need to reframe our tongue. He who loves life and see, wants to see good days, he reframes his tongue from speaking evil. And his lips from speaking deceit, from, from lying. So not only speaking evil about somebody like in gossip and all those kinds of things, but also, you know, being deceitful where you're lying and you're not telling the truth about one another. Um, that is hard to do too. Sometimes it's easier to get into those gossip parties and, and be speaking and using your tongue and you end up speaking evil. And not only are you speaking evil about that person, but you begin to tear them down and, and, and be deceitful. And it's interesting that as he goes on in verse 11, as he talks about that, which is he's quoting from here, Psalm 34, 12 to 16, he moves on into verse 11. Let him turn away from evil and do good. 
And, and I like this wide, I circled this word turn in my notes, and also I'm going to circle it in my Bible. It's a turning away. See, salvation and, and, and repentance is a 180 degree turn, turning away from the things of the world and turning into the things of God. So he says, turn away from evil and turn towards good. Turn towards doing good. So can you imagine you're driving along in, in, your, in your mind and you're heading down an evil direction. You're going in an evil direction. And you come to your senses, like the prodigal son. He comes to his senses. He's going in an evil direction. And then he turns. And he says, if I just go back to the Father. It's the same thing for us. If we realize we're going, the Holy Spirit is prompting us about something and is trying to get us to turn from something, then we need to turn from that evil and head back towards the good, towards doing good. That's why. Don't do evil for evil. Don't do deceitful things. But bless people. Don't revile. All these things Peter is saying. But turn from evil. You know. Uh, Carrie, here's another t-shirt we could write. You know. I've decided to turn from evil. <laughs> and put this verse down there as a reference. I shouldn't be laughing because it's really something we should be doing. Each day, okay, you know, people, Satan is trying to always, in temptation, to get us to do evil. To get us to walk the wrong way. I mean, am, am I telling you the truth? Is the scriptures telling you the truth? You know, that we need to turn from evil and turn towards. So you turn away from evil and you turn towards God. And you're going to see why in verse 12. But we're not finished yet. He goes on, let him, that as he turns from evil, let him speak peace and pursue it. I, I probably have really worked hard at, over the years, to try to speak peace. But I'm not sure how well I have been to do the whole area of pursuing it. You know, it's one thing to speak it, but can you imagine, you know, to go out today and speak peace, but that you determine in your heart that a goal for your life is you're going to pursue peace. That whatever is thrown at you, you're going to work it through. You're going to work on that no matter how you're feeling, your aches and pains or your sufferings or your trials or problems in your marriage or problems in your home, problems with your boss, problems with your government, problems with your country, problems with the world, whatever, that not only do you speak peace about that, but you pursue peace. And that's one of the things that I think has gone wrong in the last uh, two and a half years. You know, uh, the church and many Christians have stopped speaking peace and pursuing peace. You know, to try to do whatever we can possibly do to speak it and pursue it amongst one another, amongst people we come in contact. I don't know what you think about that, but there there we go again. Maybe it's another good t-shirt. <laughs> I've chosen today to speak peace and to pursue it. Well, boy, if you put that on a t-shirt, Carrie, we'd be in trouble because everybody would try to be knocking you off a piece and wanting to make sure that you don't have peace that passes all understanding. But that's the that's the reality. And it isn't it interesting that in the last days what this what what the evil one, Satan, is going to try to do for three and a half years, he's going to try to offer peace for the world. And then after three and a half years there's there's destruction and everything else. He's going to be like a, a, a wolf in sheep clothing where he's going to try. See, if there's anything in the world right now that people are pursuing, it's peace. Oh, if I just had this, if I just had this amount of money, if I just had this kind of trip, if I, I just, I just, I just, I just, then I will have this kind of peace. But to have the peace that passes all understanding can only be pursued in Jesus Christ. And so we pursue peace. And we need to ask ourselves, you know, are we turning away from evil? Are we turning towards good? Are we speaking peace? And are we pursuing peace? 
And remember our opening words for this section. He finally, all of you, all of you turn away from evil. All of you. Every Christian that's listening to me today, <laughs> I'm going to mess up your day. You know, you might enjoy the way you're doing things and the way you're speaking, but if it doesn't line up to the scripture, it's because you and me are part of the all. All of you, all of us, turn from evil. All of us, turn towards good. All of us, speak peace. All of us, pursue peace. <laughs> you know what I mean? Maybe we should say, hey, don't get in my way because I'm pursuing peace today. <laughs> Whatever it may be. But then he goes on, and it's interesting that he pulls out a scripture from Proverbs chapter 16, verse 7. And he says this, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. First of all, we have this word prayer. Remember when we were talking about husbands, where it says here in verse 7 that your prayers may not be hindered? Peter is now coming back to this whole idea of prayer. But he's doing something really unique here that maybe you don't notice, but he talks about the eyes of the Lord, the ears of the Lord, and the face of the Lord. Isn't that an amazing thought? When you think about it, you know, that our Lord has ears, and He is listening, He is hearing, He has eyes, and He is seeing. You know, everything we do in darkness, everything we do, whatever, He sees. And the interesting thing is, this is what blows me away. You might not get this, but He says, the face of the Lord. That means He's facing us. He's not turning His back towards us, but He's looking right at us. You know, when there, anytime you want to speak to somebody, Often you should face them. You face them face to face. Isn't that an amazing thought? Because you want to talk to them. You want to make eye contact. You want to make sure they're hearing. <laughs> Over a lot of times in Myanmar, the older people, to make sure you're listening, you know what they do? <laughs> they'll grab your hand <laughs> and they'll hold on to your hand. Just to make sure your eyes are focused, your ears are hearing, and your face is facing them. And he says, the eyes of the Lord on the righteous, those who are walking upright before the Lord, the eyes of the Lord are on you. And the ears are open to their prayers. Those who are seeking and are turning from evil and are work moving towards good, are seeking peace and are pursuing peace. The eyes of the Lord are upon you. The ears of the Lord are open to you to hear your prayers. And not only that, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So, you know, you can't hide from the Lord. He sees all, both good and evil. And he wants us to know that he sees all, he hears all, and he's facing it. He's not running from it, but he's facing it with us so that we can face it too. So as we finish up this, this, this little portion of Scripture, we see that there is a brotherly lifestyle that is given to us all, that we are to bless and you will be blessed, and that we are to love and you will be loved, and that you will give peace and you will receive peace. And most of all, that as you walk today, the eyes of the Lord are upon you, the ears of the Lord are upon you, and He's looking at you face to face. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you, Lord, for the challenges that it gives to us. And Lord, when we're feeling weak, we ask that you would help us to feel strong. When we feel persecuted and going through trials and tribulations and heartaches and pain and everything else, oh God, I just pray that we would remember that your eyes are upon us, your ears are hearing us, and you're looking into our face that we can meet face to face in the presence of you. And so, Lord, I pray for each one of us. Lord, I know for Cohen and I, we're facing different difficult things. And, and uh, for our own bodies, we're facing things. And our family members are facing things. And, and Lord, our, our churches are facing things. And, and just the, the, the trials, the tribulations, the struggles, the sufferings that are going on out there, 
seem to be enormous, O oh God. But Father, I pray that today that you would help us to speak peace and pursue peace, to be willing to go out and to do good one to another. And most of all, Lord, I pray that you would remind us through the days, through this day especially, that your eyes are upon us, your ears are open to our prayers, and Lord, that we can be looking at each other face to face in that beautiful relationship of love that, we, that you have given to us through dying on the cross. And so, Father, I commit ourselves in your hands and just ask you to be with us now through this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. I pray that that has challenged you like it has challenged me. I know we're all not perfect and we're all on a journey. But I believe that if we look to God, who he, he sees us, his eyes are upon us, his ears are listening to us, his face is focused on us, that our journey that we may be struggling with today will become a lot easier because we're not being an overcomer in ourselves, but we're being an overcomer in Christ Jesus. Amen. God bless you and Lord willing, we hope to see you again tomorrow. Bye-bye for now.